expert in this field, but uh, luckily we have two guys that are. Um, I'm going to let them kind of go into their background a little bit and tell us a little bit about their company. So, uh, Paul, why don't you kick sure. us off with Starsky? So, my name is Paul Schlegel, and uh, I've been with Starsky Robotics for the last year. I am a 33-year uh, veteran of the trucking industry. Um, uh, you can't ask me tons of technical questions because I'm not an engineer. I'm a trucker. And uh, uh, our company, Starsky Robotics, is developed to uh, develop a trucking company that supports the growth and development of AV technology. So we, we, uh, we operate a 45 truck trucking company here out of Dallas. Uh, our corporate office is in San Francisco. Um, our technology is uh, twofold. We operate AV or autonomously on the highway on short lanes and we um, once you get off the exit, we operate in remote mode. So we're developing two levels of technology, remote driving and AV technology. And uh, our, our long-term goal is not to sell our technology to uh, other trucking companies or um, to uh, uh, truck, truck manufacturers. We are going to operate a actual trucking company. And Ognen, uh, tell us a little bit about Pronto. Sure, so my name is Ognen. I'm only a three-year veteran of trucking, but I'm a 15-year veteran of, of autonomous vehicles, which is about as far back as autonomous vehicle technology goes. Um, I've worked um, trying to make you know autonomous vehicles for a while now, um, and I was part of the founding team of a company named Auto a few years ago that some of you might have heard of that did a somewhat high profile. Uh, unmanned beer delivery some years back, uh, but with our new venture, Pronto, we've come to the realization that uh, actual fully autonomous driverless trucks are quite a ways off, despite you know, 10, 15 years of heavy investment, billions of dollars, thousands of brilliant engineers working on it. I'm here to confirm to you that it's not happening anytime soon. So what we're doing with Pronto is we're taking the best technology that exists and building a what we think is the best driver assist product. So what we do is we've launched a product called Copilot, and what it does, it brings the kinds of safety features um, and convenience features that are currently only found in the highest and sort of most premium cars and makes those available in commercial trucking. So things like full adaptive cruise control, lane centering, you know, next generation automatic emergency braking that can actually fully stop a vehicle, all those things that you know have only been available for super high-end cars. Um, at a really reasonable, we think, low price point can be added to a truck to really reduce the physical workload, the physical fatigue of truck drivers um, while still very much demanding a full and active uh, driver behind the wheel. So that's a little bit about Pronto. All right. Um, this next slide is, I'm, I want to leave this up here for the whole uh, presentation because I think it's important. You'll probably hear a lot of level one, level two, level five thrown around these conversations. This is the SAE's definitions of level of autonomy. So if, if somebody, as we're talking, says level four, you can kind of look up here, follow the SAE level four, and it'll tell you exactly what level four means. So just to add a little bit of clarity as we kind of drag into this conversation, I, I spend a lot of time talking about this. I know these two guys do too. So we just want to make sure everybody's on the same page as we start talking about self-driving versus driver assist or, or automated assist. It's, it, it's all, we're all kind of shooting at the same target here. But um, you know, while we're kind of on that, we're basically at a level two of today, right? So what's, what's, what's actually commercially viable today? We, 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 we read the articles, we see the, the pictures, we see the tweets, the YouTube videos of the self-driving cars, the self-driving trucks. But what's real world in 2019? What is a, a self-driving technology today? Ognan, let's just start um, us off. Sure. So yeah, I mean, we're starting to enter the world of level two today. Um, you know, we have the first uh, level two system we're introducing in trucking. Uh, level two has existed for a few years, as I said, in high-end passenger vehicles and high-end cars already. Um, but what we have in trucks today is, you know, basic cruise control, so more like a level one and sort of really the initial collision mitigation type systems. 
and we're trying to bring that level to functionality. So we're just entering that. I think that's where it's going to stay for the next few years, getting better and better level two type functionalities. So what that means is the truck, the technology, the software can control the braking and the steering um, and the throttle of a vehicle to basically keep it centered in a lane for extended periods of time, possibly for hours at a time, hundreds of miles at a time, and keep a safe distance from the truck in front of it. But what it doesn't do with the, with the technology where it's not is, is to sort of make all the, everything else that the driver does, right? Monitor the road fully, make all the decisions, anticipate what's happening with the surrounding traffic. And so it still very much requires a fully alert, experienced, active driver behind the wheel to, uh, you know, to, to, to make sure that, that everything's doing right. Because while the technology is not getting tired, it's not getting fatigued, it, 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 where we're at today is there is no software, there is no artificial intelligence that has the experience or the prediction capability or the instincts that an experienced driver has, which is what you would need to start to get to a level four or five type deployments at some point in the future. So from Starsky's perspective, um, you know, when I joined Starsky, one of the reasons that I did was um, when I looked at autonomous, I said, you know, that's a long ways off. And I would agree um, that autonomous in a commercial setting uh, coast to coast on every lane is a long ways off, a very long ways off. Uh, Starsky's approach is to do repeatable lanes, short repeatable lanes, validate those lanes to a point where um, you, if something happens on that lane or something changes from the last time you were through there, you have a um, overlapping safety mechanism that can operate the equipment. We do believe that um, on these short lanes that uh, we're anywhere from six to 12 months from being able to take a driver out of a truck on a short lane and run it from the shipper to the consignee. So um, the, the approach that Starsky takes is limit the variables. So if you limit the variables, you operate on the same lanes, you validate those same lanes day in and day out. When there is a problem, the, um, you can identify that problem quicker. So a lot of people ask, you know, well, you do use artificial intelligence and all of this other thing and machine learning. And our approach really does not rely uh, solely on machine learning. The way we look at it is if we operate the same lane 100 times and there's something in the road, then your system recognizes that sooner than what a driver would recognize that can make the decision quicker to take the appropriate action to avoid having, having an incident or an accident. So it's very different than people that are driving, you know, or companies that are saying, hey, we're gonna go coast to coast, we're gonna prepare for every inevitable situation, we're gonna drive in all kinds of weather. What we're looking at it is short, repeatable lanes, validate the safety, and then take the driver out of the truck and be able to operate that continuously. Let's jump in a little bit with uh, each of you two guys' company strategy toward autonomy. Starsky's a little unique from Pronto. Pronto's a little unique from Starsky in that you're approaching this, uh, you're both going in the same direction, but you're going two different ways. So, um, Paul, tell us a little bit about some of the validation, some of the testing, and um, some of the efforts you guys are making. Into, you know, you'd mentioned um, taking the driver out of the truck uh, under certain circumstances. So tell us a little bit about how you see the driver getting out and then when the driver is needed and some of the tests that you've done through that. Yeah, so um, uh, on Father's Day, uh, we did a 10 mile unmanned run in Florida. Um, I think it's called uh, Hee Haw Junction. Uh, it's called Yee Haw Junction. Yee Haw, sorry, Yee Haw, sorry. Um, from a uh, rest area to a rest area. Uh, that validation, we did that run over 140 times uh, without incident. And what I say by without incident, a lot of companies that are looking at the AV space are counting the number of disengagements they have. Well, we don't do that because a disengagement is an accident. So we don't want to use a disengagement for that validation. Some companies are saying, hey, how many miles have you driven autonomously? Well, we don't use miles driven autonomously. We look at trips and we say, we have to be able to take a trip from, from one location to another location 
And if there was not a driver in that truck, nothing would have happened. Our systems have been set up to, to self-validate and to self-assess uh, uh, how they're operating. So we avoid having you know, issues because we also have a remote driver who is there to take over in the case of something going wrong. And if the system says, hey, there's a problem, then you, you go into, uh, self, or into uh, remote mode. Uh, we did that lane 140 times, and on the 141st time, we took the driver out on a public road and drove 10 miles without incident. Uh, the driver that actually drove the truck from the uh, rest area to the highway, he is here. Uh, he's at our booth, so you can come meet him. His name's Jeff, uh, and he's the one that did the, the remote driving. And then for once we got it out on the highway, that was completely with all of the technology within the truck, drove that uh, to the next exit where he got off. Ogden, how, how about walk us through some of you guys' technologies and some, how you validate that in your attack? Yeah, so, so our attack, I'd say, is pretty different um, in the sense that we do try to go everywhere. You know, we've driven in all lower 48 states and six of the Canadian provinces. We design technology that will work on any highway in most weather conditions. You know, we don't approve use right now for customers to use it in snow, rain, thunderstorms, winds, but we have done testing in that. You know, we've done snowstorms in New York. We've done thunderstorms at nighttime in Nebraska. We've done 40 mile uh, an hour crosswinds with wind gusts of 60 miles an hour in Idaho. Uh, we're sort of seeing it all because we're limiting the feature set because we're not trying to do a driverless truck. We're not trying to do a so-called level four system. Um, and as a result, because our safety case is built around a person in the seat at all times fully engaged, we're limiting uh, the functionality and making it really robust so it does work everywhere, it does scale, um, and it can go in all conditions. And so because it's a level two driver assist system that brings an additional layer of safety to the driver to help ease their basic physical fatigue so that they can then have more attention to be able to, to stay alert and fully engaged for longer, um, it, it's just a somewhat different approach. Um, you know, we did, uh, and, and that's partially because, you know, we think there's a basic science, a fundamental breakthrough that we're still waiting for in order to actually get to a point where you could actually take a, a driver um, uh, fully out of the loop. Uh, I mean, I realize you guys keep the driver very much in the loop remotely and, and through other ways, but I'm talking about entirely taking a driver out of the loop is, 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 is quite a ways off. So we, you know, I mean, I think as far as demos goes, constrained routes, I think still what we did with our with my previous Venture Auto, um, I mean, that's the kind of demo where we delivered 120 miles on a commercial basis, you know, with a driver out of the seat. Um, three years ago, it was kind of ahead of its time. I think that kind of demo won't happen again um, for, for quite a while. Um, but even that, right, we did that hundreds of times before we did that one attempt. Um, but even, you know, hundreds of times for that kind of demonstration for us, a, a driver shouldn't be crashing every 100 trips or 200 trips or 300 trips, right? Even that's too, that would be not in any sense better than, than, a, than a driver would be just, just driving the way they do today. So that's why for us it's really important to keep the driver engaged and, and be realistic about where the state of the art is and just that technology is a safety layer um, on top and then try to take that constraint, admittedly constrained feature set and scale it out across the country on, uh, on all highways. Kind of along those lines, <clears throat> how do you guys see the path toward level five developing? I mean, you, Starsky's still got the, the human element heavily involved, and then uh, Pronto's kind of trying to slowly work the human out of it. So what, what's the path to level five look like for, from a Starsky perspective? Well, from a Starsky perspective, um, we are not shooting for level five. Uh, we are looking for supervised autonomy at all times. That's why we have a trucking company, that's why we are you know, actively hiring drivers, because we believe that we will always have a need for drivers. Um, I do believe that the technology will develop over time where you, know, you can hit a button and you can make a turn, you know, and, and it will, the system will do that, but right now, uh, that's not available. By keeping the driver engaged and you know, there, uh, we give jobs to drivers, but it could the, the future job of the driver potentially is you get to go home every night. Uh, you you know pick up your lunchbox, you go in, you check in, and 
and you sit down, you know, in like what would be an air traffic control center. Uh, you may have 10 drivers in there operating more than 10 trucks, and those drivers then will supervise that truck at all times. So we're, we're not moving or planning any time in the near future to go to level five. Uh, we believe that it's important that um, a driver is always engaged uh, at this point. Uh, we think it's a long ways off for level five. Ogden, same question. How do you see us getting to full self-driving? Yeah, so I think it's going to be pretty evolutionary uh, to get there um, before you know, there's a lot of analogies made to aviation for level four autonomous vehicles. How does it compare to autopilot on planes, right? But right now we're where aviation was 100 years ago, right? Not where aviation is today. And so before the Wright brothers built an airplane, they first built a kite and they built a really good kite, the world's best kite. Then they tried to build a glider and even built a wind tunnel to test the glider. And only then did they sort of slowly work their way up to, uh, to an airplane, right? And it's the same thing with, you know, or the, or the industry autonomous vehicles are talked of as moonshots, right? But even the actual moonshot of the Apollo program, right, that built on the Gemini missions, the Mercury missions, it's all been sort of evolutionary in tech. And so that's why we're trying to introduce this Copilot product as a level two system. I mean, I think most of you that drive trucks, you'll agree that the features, the safety, convenience features you find in your trucks are not as good as the stuff you have even in your basic passenger cars today, right? So we gotta make, first we gotta get trucks to where cars are today. Then we got to perfect that and add like additional safety on top of it so that the trucks become even better than cars on the highways with respect to safety and convenience. And then over time, we might get to some um, level four, level five type deployments. But again, that's not a thing that's guaranteed to happen. If you throw a lot of money and engineers at that problem, it's not guaranteed to be solved because we're waiting for a fundamental science breakthrough on the artificial intelligence side. It might happen, I happen to think it might happen someday, but, but who knows, it could be completely wrong about that, but we can't sort of bet and wait for that to, to possibly happen someday, right? Like, maybe it will, maybe it won't. Um, and I can't tell you when that's gonna be because it's a basic science issue, it's not an engineering and sort of applied uh, problem. So I think it's gonna be an evolutionary path um, to get there. And I think in the meantime, that's gonna move the bar for driverless trucks and autonomous trucks higher because as you start to introduce these more sort of constrained technologies, um, then, then it becomes that person plus technology drives better than maybe person without technology today. But to somehow get to the point where technology by itself drives better than a person, that bar is gonna keep getting raised higher, right? Because by us introducing Copilot into the market, that makes it harder to make the case that technology can drive safer than a person because we believe a person with our technology with Copilot will be much safer and therefore it sets the bar even higher for somehow having an unmanned vehicle on the roads. Paul, do you have something to add? Um, just the other thing that I think has to happen for us ever to get to the level five is uh, government and you know, local and, and uh, federal government involvement. Uh, you know, obviously regulations are being put in place. We actually have a government affairs officer that is working to help uh, improve the uh, AV laws in, in the, across the nation. Um, but I believe that you know, it's also going to be uh, up to local municipalities to be able to say, you know, hey, do you have dedicated lanes? Do you have um, you know, situations where you, you convert your, um, your HOV lanes over to autonomous? Um, so those are the things that also I think will help you know, that in the future. We're not there yet though. I mean, those government agencies and um, you know, local and, and federal um, municipalities, they don't have the knowledge at this point, but, but we're working towards getting them there. That actually kind of walks us into my, what was my next question about regulations. <clears throat> A lot of what we've talked about, the level five, the driver not in the cab, is not even legal unless you're in certain conditions. The state of Florida is relatively friendly. Uh, Arizona is pretty friendly. I think Nevada, California, and Michigan. But for the most part, there's 30-something states that you can't even execute a lot right. of your testing in. So are we at a point to where is technology ahead of regulation? Or is regulation holding technology back? Uh, Ogden, you and I earlier had a pretty interesting conversation about regulations, kind of where we are. So uh, you know, what, are, what are your thoughts on where, how do technology and regulations, are, are they button heads? 
I mean, I, I certainly don't think they're butting heads today as far as driverless type de deployments because the technology is not there, right? So yes, you can't go driverless <laughs> in most states, but there are states you could. I mean, you could do it in Texas, actually. You could do it in Colorado, the, the states that you named. Uh, but the point is, um, it's not ready. So I think there's a tendency sometimes in the industry to say, you know, if, if the regulations were in place, you could go driverless. And I'm not saying that's what you're saying. It, it, and I wish no, sort not. of sometimes that that uh, that government would sort of call our bluff and our bluster and be like, oh, okay, go ahead, two thumbs up. If you can do it, go for it. Like, put it out there. I don't think anybody would actually be able to deliver. If suddenly FMCSA, DOTs across the states were like, do it. Give me a regular, commercially viable, I'm not talking about a demo, like an everyday type repeatable operation. I don't think any, any of our companies could step up and do that because the tech's not there. So I think the regulatory challenge is going to be important. I agree with you on that. I think it's, it's important to think ahead to those things. But I certainly wouldn't say regulations are blocking anything right now because I think, if anything, uh, let's put it this way, the marketing departments of our companies are years ahead of where the engineering departments are. And so I think it's not, that's not the regulators. Yeah, so um, we operate in the southeast. And the southeast has been somewhat friendly to autonomous vehicles. Uh, obviously, Florida, at this point, you can take a driver out of the truck and you can operate. Um, you know, the, the truck without a driver. Uh, Texas is also one of those states that you can. Uh, we, as I mentioned, we have hired a government affairs, um, you know, individual that works on helping states to understand autonomy so that they can draft bills that, you know, are, are safe and that can be accepted by, by those individual states. Um, you know, I would agree. Um, I don't think we're at a point where we're really butting up against any, uh, you know, government agency. In fact, uh, when I was in Alabama, we met with all the state legislatures, and um, it was very interesting because they just put this invite out for the Transportation Committee, and out of 40-some uh, state uh, legislators, we had 20-some uh, that showed up. So they're very interested in, in helping to move this, this forward. Uh, our approach as Starsky Robotics is that we want to be able to operate repeatable lanes in Texas and Florida because those are the states that have been very open to it. Uh, repeatable testing, uh, this is not at this point, you know, we're planning on taking the driver out of the truck. Um, and then eventually across the I-10 corridor. So. As I mentioned earlier, our approach really focuses on minimizing the variables. And when you minimize the variables and you validate a lane and you do it safely and you can do it uh, repeatably, then you can have a business case and say, you know what, on this lane, I can haul freight safely and, and effectively and efficiently, but we're not looking to you know, run coast to coast. I mean, it'll be Texas, Florida, and if we can get the I-10 corridor within the next, you know, couple of years, that, you know, our technology probably will be at a point where we're wanting to test and eventually be able to run on those lanes. And for us, there's plenty of freight in that area that we have a business validation case just in that area because we could, we could haul all the freight we could handle in just that area. What about training to use these type systems? I mean, driving a truck's not easy, but now I've got all these extra sensors, all these extra softwares, and it's supposed to make, make it safer and easier, but if, if I don't manage it correctly, it's actually gonna make everything harder and worse. So yeah, how do you educate, if you're having a conversation with a, with a carrier or with a driver, what sort of education do you have to extend to kind of show them, you know, this is how this works, this is how you use this correctly, this is kind of how you get the, this is how you get the juice from the squeeze? Yeah, sure, I mean, I'd say there, there's certainly no substitute for good training, um, you definitely need that. So a lot of our training actually has to do with what our system does not do rather than what it does do because it's pretty intuitive you you can quickly understand that hey you know this does do the steering and the braking and the throttle for me it'll keep a safe distance in the lane but it's again you don't want people sort of over trusting and pretending they have a robot truck before they actually do right and taking a nap or getting out of the seat or doing anything like that right so it's our training really emphasizes the limits of the system and responsibility there uh, rather than what it does I think uh, yeah, you mentioned adding more sensors, making it complicated. Again, our approach is 
you got to minimize all that, minimize the hardware, minimize the new sensors. All we do is we add one, one, one camera that's forward facing in a computer, and we treat it much more as a software problem rather than a hardware one where you're adding a lot of sensors. So you have to be really, we think, hardware light and software heavy. And finally, you have to really minimize the sort of the false positives. I think a lot of the problem truck drivers, the feedback we've re received anyway, I'd love to talk with people afterwards, uh, for those of you that drive for a living, um, with the existing generation of systems is that they get too many beeps and too many lights and too many whiffle, whistles with these false positives or it breaks for an overpass or does locks up the brakes on weird things. And so like, that's what we have to be aware of and we have to be treat that as a crucial part of the user experience. You're not going to improve safety if you're constantly sort of crying wolf or doing these weird things, right? And so, so that's where, where we focus on, um, on as well. But yeah, training is, is key for everything. Well, your, for you your setup's a little unique. In the, yeah, the, so um, that's, again, the reason I, I joined Starsky is to actually develop and, and grow out our trucking business. So with my experience, I was 27 years with Schneider, uh, had operated in various safety functions, training functions. I set up the CDL program uh, for third-party testing for Schneider, uh, worked for Stevens Transport here in Dallas, um, for four years on their executive team and was a part of the safety programs that they had over there. And then I worked for Roadrunner and, and all of those companies were very, very safety focused. So me coming into Starsky is about developing, first of all, a safe trucking company with safe drivers. So, uh, you know, bringing in the right drivers, those drivers that have a good safety record that are going to operate your equipment uh, in the proper way, validating them by letting them drive in a regular over the road operation so you can see how they perform. And then at the same time, equipping your trucks so that you also know that you're not gonna have issues with the truck. So we, we operate every truck before we turn it into an AV truck. We operate it in our over the road trucking business for a period of time. By doing that, we also know, hey, you know, even when you buy 10 new trucks, one of them's gonna have some little issues that you're gonna have to work through. So we work through those, then we, then we convert that over. So the training is that we bring them in, we operate them for a period of time before they can be promoted. Once they're promoted, they're promoted to the first level, which is a safety driver, which is a driver that sits behind the wheel while we are testing uh, the fleet. That way they get to understand and know how, you know, when they should, uh, you know, grab the wheel or when they should disengage the, um, the AV system. And then eventually, then they can move into the, the teleops function, which is the remote driving. And we have a full safety program around bringing people up to speed in, you know, in areas. We've shut down highways. Uh, in Florida, they shut down the HOV lanes and let us operate and test uh, on those lanes so that we can make sure that, again, that we're safe and that the, the things that we're doing um, are in line with, you know, proper training and, and proper safety. All right. Here's the... $64,000 question. A lot of drivers are in the audience. We're, we're talking about driverless trucks. How does the role of the truck driver change as we go from level two to three to four to five? Uh, what does, is the job description get wider? Does it go away? What, what, what does a truck driver look like in a driverless truck? Um. Well, in a driverless truck, I'd say there is no driver. So that's, again, <laughs> that would be unfortunate. So there would be, it, it, I mean, again, I guess you guys take a different approach. But um, I think the way it's sort of changing over time is at first you have less tired and safer drivers, but the job stays pretty much the same. I think as long as you have a person in the cab, the job is going to be pretty much the same as it is now. Um, what's going to be different is ideally it's going to be safer, and it's going to be less tiring, and it's going to be more convenient, right? because you're going to get these additional layers of safety and convenience on top. It's just going to be more comfortable. Um, I think with that in mind, if you can stay safer for longer, it's possible over time that I think you might be able to start getting some hours of service relief on that, because if you can be shown to be safer with technology in a truck, possibly you know, you don't, you know, you, you're less tired, so you can maybe drive longer. You know, that, that actually would require regulatory approval. And, 
and to get there. But I think maybe as, as we try to start scaling the systems up or improving, there's, there might be opportunities for that. That would re obviously require deep engagement with regulators. But given that there's some hours of service reforms going on right now, that might be up, uh, I don't know, for conversations. Um, then, uh, then, you know, as, as you get eventually, if, if there is, you know, the day that scientific breakthrough comes and on some limited capacity, some lanes, um, there's driverless trucks, maybe some over the road, limited route segments, then, then the job changes entirely in the sense that there's no maybe, maybe drivers at all for, the, for those runs. But even then, you could imagine that on those lanes are going to attract a lot more traffic and for first last mile type movements, you might actually end up needing a lot more drivers. But then you, maybe you see people shifting from over the road type driving to more you know, day halls, regional type um, activity. But again, that's that's pretty speculative right now. That's my, I should clarify, that's my own personal opinion, not necessarily Pronto's, because we just don't know. We don't know when, when that day Paul, before you jump in, I want to follow back up to one of your examples, Ogden, that maybe you, let's just say there's been some sort of regulatory relief the, that the, the, the driving time has been extended because you do have the, the supplement there from the automatic system. So what would you think the driver would be doing while the truck is driving? Are they sleeping? Is it a paperwork scenario? Is it a co-pilot scenario? Oh, no, I, I mean, I think the driver would have to be, so, so just to clarify, I mean, they'd have to be alert and sort of watching the road at, um, at all times. I just think sort of within maybe their 14 hours of on-duty time, they could, they would not be a start, so possibly they could stay safe even maybe beyond 11 hours. I, I wouldn't necessarily say they'd be doing anything too different. I think they should be in the seat paying attention to the road. You could imagine maybe, again, this is kind of speculative, as you get to stop and go type traffic conditions and its systems are proven reliable, maybe at that point if you get stuck in traffic, you could actually get away with and be allowed to text or call ahead or just, just sort of take your off, eyes on the road at certain low speed environments still on the highway while stuck in gridlock to sort of check in, plan ahead, do different things. And by, again, I think for those kinds of things to happen, you'd have to work really carefully with carriers, with regulators to, to develop best practices and training to enable those kinds of activities. Um, but I think the idea that somebody's going to be napping in the truck for an extended period of time, all the truck drivers itself, and then jump back on duty, it's, it's like, why, right? Like, if you can get away with a person sleeping for hours, then that person shouldn't be in the truck at all, right? Um, because at that point, you're just risking somebody's life by being in a moving vehicle. Right. Um, like, we all do, even the safest drivers, by virtue of being on the road, there's a risk, right? Um, so, so I don't think anybody will be napping. Hopefully not. This is the problem. This is why training is so important, right? People sort of misuse, even you see the videos, right? I'm not gonna name any brands of car companies, but you can guess, right? People take YouTube videos of themselves doing crazy things, and cars that are not actually self-driving that they should not. All right, Paul, sorry we pivoted yeah. there just a little bit. But, no, um, it's fine. You know, kind of, how do you see the, the role of the truck driver evolving? Um, so first of all, Starsky was founded 100% on improving the life of the driver. Um, Stefan, from the, he did an internship in logistics, and, and his comment was, this is insane. You know, people are being, you know, asked to be out on the road, away from their families, you know, driving for very extended periods of time, uh, you know, in a monotonous job that uh, you can lose focus very easily. And his, his approach was, hey, we've got to find a way to provide a driver a job where we can take them out of the cab of the truck. Until that happens, you're really not going to get the gains from a you know, productivity standpoint or the business case to make it work. So he believes very strongly that um, our goal is to get the driver out of the truck eventually. But in the meantime, we actually are one of the few companies that has a career path for a driver. We want to hire qualified, quality drivers after six months you know, of them driving with us, they've got to have at least two years experience, but after six months driving with us, they can become a safety driver. They can do that for a year, and then hopefully by that time, we'll be at a place where we will have multiple teleops centers where they can get up in the morning, pick up their lunchbox, go to work, check in, uh, you know, drive uh, for short periods of time, to the pickups or the deliveries um, and monitor the equipment as it's going around, going down the road. So their job will become much more of a, a, you know, a job where they go to work. Plus, 
that job appeals to the millennial crew that everybody knows you can't hire right now. Um, you know, somebody said, you know, millennial, millennial hiring, if you hire a millennial driver, there's 300% turnover of that, that driver group, 300%. So you look at, somebody also told me that for every, you know, 50 year plus driver that decides to leave the industry, that driver that has 10 years experience takes 100 drivers to replace that productivity of that driver in one year. And if you don't believe me, just ask any trucking company out there. They'll all tell you, we can't find drivers. We can't find good drivers. It takes us 10 drivers just to get somebody to, to keep the truck moving for six months. So it's a big problem. And we believe the only way to get to the, to the level that we want is to get the driver out of the cab and to give them a job that they can go home to their family every night. All right, we've got about 10 minutes left. I'd like to open up that last 10 minutes to audience q and I know you guys have probably got more questions than, than I do, um, and they would be grounded in some real world experience. So they'd probably be more interesting than my questions, but uh, I've got several more. So um, you know, if, if anybody has any questions, please raise your hand. We've got a couple of mics walking around. We'll be glad to take them. Check, check. Hi, all right, great. Uh, so I had a question about some of the equipment and, and maybe OEM relationships that you have uh, while you develop your trucks. I'd love to understand more about that. Like, do you partner with OEMs? Do you develop your own sensors? What kinds of sensors? Just more detail around that. Sure, so uh, the question was, do we partner with OEMs, with other providers? Look, we work with... So, so, is this on? Yes. Hello. Mine is. Hello. Mine is on. All right. Cool. Uh, <laughs> yeah. So, 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 you know, we're willing to work with everyone. Like, we are a software company. We develop software. We're not in the business of building hardware. Pretty much everything we buy is off-the-shelf component. You know, I can't sort of speak specifically who we work with, but we're not in the business of manufacturing uh, vehicles. Certainly, we're not in the business of doing hardware. Um, nor are we even in the business um, of running our own trucking company, right? We're not a carrier. We are a technology provider, we're a solutions provider to carriers and to owner ops. So we have to work with others. Our software um, is platform neutral. Um, the same thing that we can run on a Class A tractor, the same computer and the same camera that enables uh, a, a Class A tractor to, to do the steering, braking, and throttle. Um, is the exact same one that we run on a Toyota Prius, for example, when we do some of our testing on light passenger vehicles. So we're very platform neutral, um, but you know we'll we're happy to partner. I think there's uh, you know your question about OEM. I think it makes sense over time. For you know right now our product is an aftermarket product. We are happy to work with folks to develop uh, and potentially offer our system as a as maybe well, when you spec your trucks to be able to select our system um, to be included you know off the line if you're buying a new truck. But we're mostly neutral. So our, our robo robotics um, operate over top of any current safety systems um, of, the, of the truck manufacturers. So uh, any of our trucks can be operated by a driver or they can be, any of our autonomous trucks can be operated by a driver or um, autonomously. So we try not to um, uh, interfere with any of the current safety systems that are, are in a truck. We, we actually uh, work over top of the, the current systems. Um, so we're not necessarily uh, tied directly to any specific OEM. Uh, we have a Freightliner AV truck and we have Volvo AV trucks right now. Um, as we move into what we're going to call much more of a production or manufacturing stage, we are looking for partnerships for the manufacturing piece um, because in order to you know put it on a hundred trucks, you got to build the same model and be able to uh, you know put it across those, and we don't have the manufacturing capabilities to do that. So we are looking for those types of partnerships at this point. 
whether that's an OEM that is interested in working with us uh, to gain equipment and put it on the trucks, uh, or it's somebody that is, um, you know, a manufacturer that can put the equipment on. So, uh, but right now we're not, we're not reliant on on those relationships. Thank you. Thank you. Um, first of all, thanks to you guys. It's, a, I think, a great panel. Um, a question for you, uh, specifically for Starsky, maybe also for Pronto, but how do you differentiate to your customers? And do you, do, you, do you have pixie dust that you sprinkle on, a, you know, on an RFP where you say, we, we do something differently, or do you compete like everybody else? I mean, is there, is there any other differentiation than you would have if you operated a non-autonomous fleet of vehicles? Um, so, the way we operate, again, um, is right now we have a regular trucking company. So, that regular trucking company, we have preferences in certain lanes and certain areas that eventually could be autonomous. We put regular drivers on those. We will put autonomous trucks to test on those lanes with a driver driving and gathering data and then we validate which lanes are gonna be best for us, and then we work with broker relationships. So we have multiple broker relationships. The second part, or the third part of kind of our technology is we are looking to eliminate um, a sales function and a dispatch function within our company. So the goal is to work with multiple brokers with open API and be able to automatically dispatch a truck by pre putting our preferences in and selecting freight. So when, you know, we will not operate a lane without a driver in it on a lane that a customer doesn't know about it. We're, we're very, very transparent in that. We do test on lanes and if we are testing on a specific lane, we talk with the broker and the customer to make sure that they are okay with us testing on that lane and We've really not had any issue with people being okay because when we're testing, you, you have a remote driver and you have a driver in the truck. I guarantee you that truck's safe. So, uh, plus we get, we get a terabyte of information every two days on every autonomous truck. So when, you, you know, when your insurance provider asks you to plug that little USB into your car so they could see how you drive, we can pretty much validate how that, that equipment is operating better than anybody in the industry at this point. Agnes? Yeah, I mean, we're, we're, we're not a carrier. We're not running a trucking business. Um, uh, you know, we tried that model with Auto, which again, as far as demos and visions with a you know, previous venture, as far as what a driverless truck could be, we tried that, but like you said, you know, it was the idea that sort of sprinkling some fairy dust and being the magical driverless carrier was gonna teach us how to do run a trucking company when we were experts at software in a Silicon Valley tech company, that was not, that was sort of not workable in the long run. And you know, when we did the automated brokerage thing too, I mean, you know, auto also, Uber Freight, what's today called Uber Freight was also part of auto. You know, we started that business as well in conjunction to run sort of a magical carrier that wouldn't have drivers and would automatically book all the loads. Um, so, you know, Uber Freight wound up being a great standalone business that's still going today. I think they have a booth. I'm still a happy shareholder even though I don't work there anymore. Um, but the idea that sort of we, we decided to play to our strengths, right? Our strengths are software, making great tech, making great safety tech, not being a carrier. And so we just, we don't, we don't do that. All right, we got enough time for one more. Betsy, who you? Okay. So when you talk about the remote drivers and grabbing your lunch pail and going in, so you're going to have a driver that's in the office looking after one truck or after a number of trucks? Um, initially, it'll be one truck. Uh, eventually, the idea would be as your technology improves and you have the capability of, um, you know, uh, automated uh, signals and things like that, uh, then you would, you know, eventually gravitate to additional trucks. How many? I don't know. Um, you know, when, when a tr truck is out on the highway and, you know, driving in a, no traffic, it, it needs very little supervision. Uh, when a truck is in heavy traffic, it would need, you know, different. So if you have a 
what I, again, what I would call like an air traffic control center with 10 drivers, uh, you know, you could, you could get to a, a, you know, a large number of trucks being operated by those 10 drivers. I don't have a number at this point. Uh, right now, we're, we're focused on one remote driver for one truck. We have time for one more. Hey, uh, great, great presentation. I have a couple of questions. Marketing aside, uh, how do you compare uh, where you are right now to some of the other uh, software companies that are tackling something similar, like Tesla out there? And when you're looking at something like safety, where it's a preventable thing, like you're preventing incidents from happening, uh, how do you measure success? Because how do you know how many times you would have saved that thing? Just curious. Do you want to start or? Sure. I mean, um, I'd say uh, on for a highway system, I, it's, I think we have the the best uh, highway self-driving system out there. Um, you know, uh, we don't do urban driving, uh, but we, like I said, we do go on all highways in all 48 states, or not all, the lower 48 states. Um, there are two more, um, and. Uh, and you know, I think uh, I think it's the, the way I think you need to compare it is like, can you actually make a real product again on a, on a demo basis? Um, maybe you can sort of show some different things that look more advanced and make the future seem closer than it really is. But I'd say what our level two technology is able to do today, being productized and adding real value to real customers um, through a real product, that is already even the basics of that are far more advanced than the so-called sort of level four systems, the prototype level four systems, which you know don't work in anything but the sunny, dry heat of pick your southeastern state, right? And so, um, and so I think the, the the core tech is far more advanced than anything out there. We're just choosing to limit its functionality to the point where we can actually ship a real product and deliver something more, uh, more, uh, more than demo. Um, on the safety front, look, I think it's going to be at the end of the day, it's going to be in crash rates, right? You have to look at, it's going to be a lagging indicator, admittedly, but you have to look at, it's not about, dis I totally agree with you when you mentioned, it's not about disengages, it's not about total miles driven. It's like, are you crashing more often or less often? Right? And so you just have to look at, what did what the crash rates look like with your technology versus without your technology? And frankly, uh, you know, my, my colleague, our chief safety officer, has been outspoken about this. The level four industry, you know, which I started off, off in and a lot of other people are still pursuing, that industry is actually can be shown to be demonstrably less safe than regular drivers today, right? People that are prototyping level four vehicles with a safety driver inside them tend to crash more often than, than people just going about their daily business alone, right? So that's a real problem. So I think safety, you really just have to look at the, what do we know about safety? It's, so as I, I understand your question was a little different about near, maybe near misses or like a potential accident, but I think at the end of the day, we have to look at actual accidents. What kind of collisions are you getting into? How severe are they and how frequently do they occur? That's the real proof in the pudding. Yeah. So when I think about safety, um, you know, we want to make a, a product that is as safe as the best driver out there. So when you think about it, um, it's been, you know, I heard the statistic over, what is it, over 95% of accidents are caused by some type of human behavior. We have the ability, it's going to take time, to program out 95% of those inevitabilities. Now, those other things are still going to happen. And in the industry, we'll probably be held to a higher standard just because of the fear and the concern in the industry. But, it, you know, no accident is what we're shooting for, is there, there shouldn't be an accident that, you know, that we have that if a driver was driving that truck, that accident may have occurred the same way with a driver driving the truck. The difference is our reaction time is less, which sh immediately makes it safer. We have nobody driving down the road, checking their Facebook you know, status, checking their Twitter feeds. We have nobody that is fatigued that's operating that piece of equipment that, that shouldn't be operating that equipment. We have nobody using controlled substances driving down the road. So when I look at this, and again, coming from the industry, and when I sat down and I talked to our founder and he started to tell me how we were approaching it, I said, well, we're already safer 
than you know, any driver that's out there on the road. Are we gonna have incidents? Yes, we're gonna have incidents, but I agree wholeheartedly, we should have significantly, and I mean significantly fewer accidents if we can program out 95% of the, the behavioral issues that cause the accidents on the road. We can be in the right lane. We can travel at the right speed. We don't have to change lanes because we're in a hurry because we want to get home. All of those factors to me say that AV will be a safer option for the industry as a whole. But you got to make sure your remote drivers aren't doing that either. Yeah, right? that's you can't true. have your remote drivers texting and checking. Yeah. Right? <laughs> that's true. Also, <laughs> but much easier to control, yeah. Much but, easier. Can to I just, but I mean, I think your point is well taken. I just want to say, like, the 95% human error, that's not all truck drivers' fault, right? Like, it's, no. that includes human error. Most of that human error is four wheelers doing weird things about trucks, and then the trucks wind up crashing. Yeah. So the software has to mitigate. It's not really about fixing drivers. Like, the solution, like, taking a person out, a truck driver out of the truck does not automatically fix the entire 95% because a lot of that is due to, so the software has to ameliorate and anticipate and fix for, like, the weird behavior of the cars around your automated truck not just sort of fix the problems that the truck driver themselves might have caused, which are you know, only a fraction of the 95% of yeah, the and, and causes. Yeah, and adding on to that, their technology yeah. is designed to do that as well, because again, human behavior is, you know, if I see something in the road, it takes me three to five seconds to, to recognize and react to that thing in the road. The systems that we are creating are designed to do that much faster. And you know, somebody, there was a study recently about um, crashes with cars um, that have um, sensors to, to keep them from running into other you know, cars. And they have proven that that has significantly helped uh, you know, four-wheelers to keep from having rear-end collisions. So agree wholeheartedly that uh, our technology has to be as good, as I said, as the best driver on the road, and we want it to be significantly better so that the reaction time is faster, so that those accidents don't, don't occur in the first place. All right, well, that puts us up against time. Um, Paul, Ogden, I appreciate you guys joining us today. Some great information. If you had a question and didn't get to ask it, or if you were a little shy and you just didn't want to ask it in front of everybody, I'm sure these two guys would be glad to talk to you once this is over. You could, and once we have to vacate this for the next session, I'm sure you can find Paul at his booth. Um, I appreciate you I'll guys. I'll be right outside. I'm six foot nine, so I don't yeah, have a booth, he, but like, he, I'll wait hard, out here. He's hard to miss. That's why we had to, to sit down. I said we are not standing, because. <laughs>